Uh, and now we're going to have this panel, amazing panel discussion. And again, like people from a lot of different countries investing in time of global chaos. Please welcome Ankit Sarwahi, Executive Director at MEVP, Musalah, Country Director of Startup Grind in Jordan, Sharif Al Badawi, Managing Partner of Plus Venture Capital, Claudia. Makadristo, Regional Manager for Africa at Seed Stars, and Priya Rajan, Market Lead for India and UAE in SVB's International Market Development Team. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mo, and I run Startup Grind in Jordan, and I'm the moderator for this panel, and I'm very, very honored to have Claudia Sharif and Ankit. Unfortunately, Priya couldn't join us. It's a, it's a big celebration weekend oh. for, for Indians all over the world. Yeah. Uh, yeah I wish yeah. them a very heavy weekend. So uh, let, I, I will let, let our speakers just uh, start with a very, very short introductions. And ladies goes first. Claudia, go ahead. I just knew that you were going to say that, but uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so yeah, I'm Claudia. I'm actually currently the regional manager for Seed Stars in Africa. So uh, long story short, we are a global entrepreneurship education company, but also an, uh, an active impact investor in emerging markets. Um, so we operate in over 90 emerging markets globally, over 25 in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and we also work with a global network of about 3000 uh, investors that uh, rely on us uh, for the newest, let's say, deal flow coming from these uh, emerging markets. Um, so I've spent the past five years working mostly on the ground uh, in the continent uh, across all of these 25 different uh, emerging markets, scouting for the next uh, best entrepreneurs, so to say. Okay, Sharif. So if you're muted, so you're just going to need to unmute yourself. All right. Thanks, Mo. And hi, everyone. Great to be here with Startup Without Borders. Uh, my name is Sharif al Badawi. I'm a managing partner of a new venture capital fund called Plus VC. Uh, it's an early stage C to Series A investment firm uh, focused on the MENA region and its diaspora. Uh, we're sector agnostic. Uh, prior to that, I was a managing partner at 500 Startups, managing the MENA fund for that the last few years. Um, we've done a couple hundred investments together as a team, and we plan on doing another 120 or so in the next three years. Also seed to Series A focused uh, across the Middle East. Uh, next. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's an absolute thrill to be here, especially uh, sharing screen space with, uh, with none other than Mo Salah. So it's a huge uh, thrill. Uh, I'm sorry, I was waiting to, I was waiting for that one. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, everyone, I think, every everyone is doing it to me and every every time I think it's not going to happen anymore. The guy is already well established and uh, the, the joke is old. Someone came up with something, Some someone comes up with something new. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So uh, guys, thank you for having me here. And I work for Middle East Venture Partners. Uh, we're a growth stage uh, investor in Middle East, uh, some interest in Turkey and Pakistan as well. Uh, my focus at the firm is, uh, is divided across consumer internet, uh, across GCG uh, and Egypt. Uh, I've left investments for the fund in uh, companies like Nana, the luxury closet, Rise, uh, and I'm thoroughly uh, looking forward to uh, uh, my time with all of you guys. Thank you uh, all for joining us. I'm just going to start with Sharif because uh, he have a quite, he had a very quite unique year. Uh, Sharif, you spent, I think, the past years in, um, as the most active investor in the region by far. And you fundraised for a new fund uh, during COVID. What what have changed in the in the region and how investors are reacting differently, and what's your takes out of this um, different journey? I would say. Uh, sure, thanks, Mo. So, I mean, we, we are fundraising. I wouldn't say we finished or anything like that. This is a process, just like for founders, it's a process, and we're setting up a new firm. 
takes you know four to six months just on the technical, the, you know, the back office, setting up structures, uh, getting all the, the ducks in a row. Uh, so doing it during or, or, or aside from a pandemic wouldn't really matter. It's work that has to be done. We just did it all remotely. Uh, I'd say that's more convenient. And, you know, but what's something we noticed is we, we fully deployed our first fund uh, around March, April of last year, uh, earlier this year, uh, right when the pandemic started. And and to me, as you guys know, like I, we, we do four to five deals a month and it, it's a high pace. It's approximately 23% of all seed deals in the region. So when we came to a halt, uh, just because we were done deploying capital, uh, it happened to be at around the time where investments dropped off a cliff generally what, in terms of number of deals, maybe not so much uh, in terms of dollars, but I think there's a lagging indicator that, you know, the deals you hear get announced these days were, were deals that are being done in Q1. So, you know, it, it it's going to show, I think, as well from a dollar perspective, but it's clear to us that deals, investors are reticent during this pandemic this year, uh, either waiting to see or it's a timing thing, right? Funds deploy every three to four years. So it happens to be in 2020, a time when, or, you know, right after many funds had had raised their funds in 2017 and 18. So a lot of folks were running out of capital or reserving capital for their per current portfolio through follow on investment, uh, either to rescue companies during COVID or otherwise. So it, it presented a landscape challenge for this region uh, that I, I'm not sure if other regions face similar dynamics, but we noticed it very early in Q2 that not only are we out of money, uh, but a lot of investors are either in between funds or holding whatever capital they have uh, reserved and allocated for current portfolio, or they just don't have you know capital to deploy or don't want to deploy. Like, private sector capital sources, family offices, holding companies, corporates, we're holding capital for sure, uh, just to see what happens, you know, with, with the rest of the pandemic. So for us, I think that that made us, it made me even more, um, you know, anxious to get a new fund off the ground. So it's not a question of whether raising a new fund during pandemic, well, of course, we were going to raise a new fund. That's the plan. That's what we do, uh, whether it was with uh, the 500 brand or separately. Uh, it, it, the timing had just happened to co coincide with the pandemic. So I don't think we are different or brave or anything for raising a fund during this time. That's just a natural course. The only thing I can regret is that there is a gap uh, in, in between when we ran out of capital and when the new capital will start being deployed. And, you know, hopefully soon uh, so that we can get back in the market and hopefully encourage other investors to get back in the market as well. Uh, interesting. Thank you, Sharif. Uh, talking dollars, um, the, the regions have seen 8% decline in the amount of money for, uh, invested in the first half of the year. As Sharif said, mostly we know about the deals a quarter or two after. So I think uh, we're going to, um, the data of, H, uh, of H2 uh, of this year will be the, the real representation of how, how the decline uh, was big or, 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 or small. I'm just going to move to Claudia. Claudia invests mainly in Africa through 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 seed stores, and Africa have seen the largest decline worldwide. We've seen around 40% decline, which is a massive number, and if we compare it to the other the other continents, Claudia, how how you guys are dealing with this, and how investors reacted in Africa, and what what have changed over the course of uh, the past let's do let's say three quarters. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think it's quite a bit of like a lot of similar points that, that Sharif was raising. It's indeed true. I mean, not only did we decline, let's say, 50, 40% compared to others, I, even if you put like the number compared to the past year, right? So um, I think until Q1, March, we were actually on track as a region of uh, hitting new records. So looking at the investment landscape, African startups had, you know, actually raised about 40% more compared to to around uh, the same time in 2019. So it was looking very great. Then in March when Corona hit, you could definitely see uh, a drop. Um, and then I think after that, you know, just kind of like looking at the investment data, it started going like up and down a little bit. So in April, May, it increased a bit and then it started dropping again. So I think that most inve um, active investors in Africa are actually used to and prepared to dealing with, you know, market shocks. Uh, because it happens quite a bit in different countries uh, in the African continent. 
Uh, and then also, you know, several countries actually have seen pandemics before, of course, in, you know, quite recent years. Uh, but this one was definitely like a new type, right? And hitting some of those like usual suspect countries such as Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa, where typically these investments um, are happening. Um, so the initial reaction at the time back in March was that, you know, investments in many ways just came to a pause, uh, especially for new deals, and also it became all of the sudden impossible to do things like physical to due diligence. Um, so I think just many investors wanted to see how the dust would settle. Um, so when things started like picking up a bit again, uh, quite a bit of investors decided to actually indeed provide like follow up funding or refinance their their current portfolio companies. Um, and for those that did do new deal investments, uh, I would say the initial reaction was also to look how they could actually diversify the portfolio. Um, so because obviously, you know, within the pandemic, uh, a lot of businesses were also really declining, but there were also quite a bit of businesses and deals that were actually uh, thriving, right? Um, so I think later in the year, probably around Q2, Q3, actually, uh, what you saw is that, you know, some health tech startups started to receive a, a bit more investment. Um, and then, you know, we also have, of course, you know, the, let's say the investors that just do investment, uh, but also quite a bit of investment backed, you know, entrepreneurship education programs such as ourselves uh, and some of our colleague organizations, so to say. Um, I think for those type of, you know, programs, um, I think the sentiment was that if in any time we should be supporting entrepreneurs, it should be right around this time. Um, so you did see still, you know, quite a bit of those investment back programs actually uh, happening. Um, and then maybe my last point, because uh, I've already been talking quite a bit. Um, I think from our point of view, you could really clearly see that the top founders in our portfolio were, you know, the ones that were really decisive and, you know, cost cutting, um, proactive, um, going into like an interesting strategic direction. Uh, and in actual several cases came out of the crisis stronger, right? So from an investment point of view, it was very interesting to look at them and see how we could support them further. Okay, um, very, very interesting. Um, Annette, um, we're, during our time preparing for this panel, you mentioned um, for, uh, some funds decided to focus on, on their own portfolio and Sharif and Claudia second that thought. How big, the, the, how big was that shift in focus? And uh, how much do you think it's going to impact the ecosystem? Uh, yeah, uh, I think it is it's all about going back to the fundamental of having uh, the one in the hand being worth two in the bush. Uh, I think it was, it, was, it was a blessing of sorts for a lot of our portfolio companies because uh, there was a lot of uh, introspection uh, on both sides, you know, being more efficient on the cost structure vis-a-vis -vis being more aggressive on market entries and, and, and expansion. Some of the things that we saw with uh, with consumer internet, at least with startups like Nana, for example, in the online grocery space, was that uh, an an immediate spike in adoption and a, uh, a sharp drop in customer acquisition costs, uh, uh, an unincentivized increase in uh, loyalty and retention, uh, and what that meant was it it ushered in a lot of learnings. For, for these founders, um, they were they were tired of spending money on uh, Google and Facebook, uh, and and uh, organic growth for them was I think a, a supply of fresh of fresh air. Uh, at least in my experience, I saw that uh, uh, we got a lot of interest from strategics. You know, old traditional businesses. Uh, got very interested about uh, our portfolio. We had a lot of queries coming in about whether there's fundraising happening in some of these companies or not. Uh, a great example is the round we, or rather the bridge round we closed in the luxury closet where uh, Huda Investments, they invested, uh, which is a great example of how strategics and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, largely offline businesses have started to look at, uh, at, the, at the technology space. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, going back to where it all began in the portfolio was uh, was a it was a great moment to to be able to do that. Uh, okay, thank you, Anik. 
Sharif, um, Alec mentioned um, an interest from offline businesses and let's say um, the corporates who didn't invest much in the ecosystem before. Uh, what do you think or have you seen any difference in their interaction with the ecosystem? Yeah, certainly. Um, I, I, I'd agree with Ankit's points. Uh, we saw like a flurry of investment bankers and advisory firms reach out to us and say, we want to look at your portfolio. We have a client in X space who is looking to buy up a tech company. Well, you know, you've heard the, the, the saying that, you know, this, this pandemic has catalyzed technology in the region forward by at least five years, right? It, it just catapulted everybody forward to think about technology solutions and none other than incumbent traditional businesses who don't have enough tech you know, they're, they're obviously attention was grabbed and, and they're looking now to how they're going to subsidize their current offerings or uh, try to avoid obsolescence in the future. And so that's a really, really good sign for us, because if you look at the complete cycle of entrepreneurship, the one thing that probably a lot of us have questions about is exits. And, you know, where are we going to get those exits from? Traditionally, in the last 30, 40 years, at least in Silicon Valley and otherwise, technology companies buy technology companies right for market expansion for for product for team uh, but you know in the very beginning it was traditional companies that were buying technology companies so we need to hit that inflection point in this region it hasn't been there in the last four or five years actually most of the acquisitions that have happened in the last four or five years here in the region have happened from tech companies to tech companies so i think it's a really good sign I have only seen a little bit of flutter of uh, conversations and interest in the last six months or so. I haven't seen a lot of uh, trigger pulling just yet. So at least it's a good sign going forward. I, I'm hoping that this will continue and the trepidation around spending uh, will start to fade away in Q1 of 2021. And people get back in the game, say we need to get back to business and start to actually uh, you know, make acquisitions in the tech space. So that would be great for all of us. It would be great, of course, for founders and for the talent in the region. Uh, it'll provide validation similar to, you know, the, what, what, what happened with Kareem's exit to Uber. Um, that, that woke up a lot of family offices who said, you know what, maybe we should allocate a little bit of investment to venture capital, uh, not just public equities and, and private equity. So I think slowly but surely uh, we're moving in the right direction. All the same, the signals are there. It's hard to be patient uh, when you're in the middle of, you know, this this ecosystem as a little bubble. Um, but if you step step back and take a look at how fast things are evolving in Africa and Middle East and and uh, in just emerging markets in general, they are happening at lightning speeds compared to what you know the speed was in mature markets. So just take the UK for example and and its rise into uh, startup ecosystem. It, it took maybe 20 years, 30 years, and that's a mature market. So we're impatient, but these things here are taking four, five, six years, right? And they're happening pretty fast if you take a step back and look at it from that point. Thank you, Sharif. I'll get back to you uh, in a bit uh, to talk about the future of the ecosystem or uh, the emerging markets. But I just want to ask um, uh, Anect and Claudia, uh, what is different uh, or what investors need to take into consideration when they are investing in, in the different markets we have, especially in Africa, let's say India and Asia, um, in, uh, in, in comparison to when they invest in Europe or, or mature markets? I think ladies right, like, <laughs> go goes first, I guess. I'm not sure. <laughs> you can say that. Um, yeah, sure. No. Um... Look, I think Africa in, in, in many ways, actually for years now, I mean, that whole notion of, you know, Africa as the next big thing, the middle class is rising. It's actually not really recent. I feel like that has been being said for like the past like 10 or 15 years. Uh, I think we're getting to, you know, to a point from an investment point of view that, you know, you have quite a bit of international investors that are kind of like on the fence, right? Like, what if we invest and we lose it all because Africa is so risky. But what if we don't invest and we're losing out on the wave? So I think just like looking again at the numbers, how investment has been increasing, it is quite interesting that, you know, we're getting more, let's say, active investors on the continent actually deploying market, uh, deploying money. Uh, I would say, you know, Africa in itself, right? It's actually not just like one you know, country, we're talking about like 54 uh, or 55, dependent on <laughs> what, uh, what you go by uh, countries that we're talking about. 
and every market is actually you know extremely different like saturated um then within those markets you know we have really like high friction environments right so from a capital point of view business regulatory point of view currencies are less stable uh, economies are are very you know uh, often exposed to shocks um and then the markets in itself are small fragmented even if you look sometimes at you know what look like the biggest market right like nigeria is actually extremely let's say segmented from a market point of view so i would say that you know a lot of times when investors that are not from the continent kind of like look at africa they come in with this like you know big mind and i think that the reality sometimes is just you know a little bit different right again we're not necessarily one one country in itself so i think it's important for anywhere in the world probably right but it really goes back to you know really understanding the context in which we operate um and don't get me wrong like despite all of these you know challenges that i'm naming I do think it's a very interesting market because in many ways it is virgin in many ways there is you know a lot to solve i think now the ecosystem is growing so things such as you know the acquisition of paystack that got bought for 200 million you know hopefully that kind of like spurs this new wave of you know international companies wanting to enter the african market through similar acquisitions such as those so i think that there's a lot of interesting opportunities happening but i would just always say that it's important to be considerate of the context don't see it as like one big thing understand the differences that we have and the different opportunities that come with that and also just from an investment point of view i think maybe different compared to silicon valley at least in the past right is that before silicon valley it was really from an investment point of view investments were spent to find um, the user base with the most growth potential uh, and not necessarily too worried about profits. I know that has been changing a bit, but I think in Africa, again, because of the context in which we operate, investment is typically spent to find like a solid, solid business model and to become as profitable as fast uh, as we can. And in that process, you'll see that, you know, some of the investment rounds are tend to be a bit smaller as well. But we want to make sure that at each step that, you know, the companies are actual, actually able to deal with different market shocks. Because uh, as I mentioned before, we have experienced much more than just Corona there. Thank you. Anect? Yeah. Uh, look, if I were to compare uh, or look at the, uh, the key fundamentals of, uh, of India and compare that to GCC or parts of uh, the rest of the MENA, uh, India continues to be a, a country with a very, very large uh, middle class. So I think consumer is any sort of any form of consumer internet is is uh, uh, will will grow rapidly if if done right. But that will also mean that it's expensive. Uh, and a case an example is Reliance Geo, right, uh, which attracted I don't know close to twenty billion dollars uh, in a matter of uh, six months back in the middle of uh, of the lockdowns. Uh, but that will be rich, it will be expensive, but it will also uh, uh, throw high investor uh, investor returns as well. Uh, but there are opportunities in India now on the on uh, on the related aspects of uh, of the overall consumer economy, like edtech. So companies like Baiju's attracting top dollar from Facebook, uh, White Hack Junior. Uh, uh, and uh, a coding startup uh, getting acquired for, uh, I think, a close to a $300 million deal. Uh, so there are new uh, green spaces uh, in India, uh, which will always uh, keep throwing interesting opportunities. Uh, but again, I think the majority of the value creation for an investor will be created in the consumer space. Uh, and that is a similarity we feel uh, that is identical to the region in GCC as well as parts of uh, North Africa. I think the consumer segment uh, will be will be key to any investor's uh, success. Whoever gets that right in the portfolio or for a one-off investment uh, will generate the right returns on the on the uh, on the on the portfolio. However, I think uh, the requirements or the asks of a startup in in Mina are very different compared to the asks in India. Uh, a startup in Mina is uh, is always. Uh, is required to be very nimble and flexible to be able to move into new countries. You go 100 miles in either direction and it's a new set of regulation. It's a new class of user. 
uh, at times there is personalization even in uh, experience and language that is required. You need to hire a team that is multinational. Uh, you need to hire a team that is uh, at times very expat oriented, be able to manage these resources in different time zones. Uh, and then on top of that, have, uh, find founders who've, uh, who've taken the, the step to come back after their B schools in the US or after a consulting career with uh, one of the top uh, uh, consulting firms. So uh, yeah, the mix of a successful startup in, in MENA is is very colorful, very dynamic compared to what you see uh, uh, in other markets, owing to the factors that I just uh, elucidated. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have nine minutes left, so I'm just going to ask Sharif one more question and try to take questions from the audience. So Sharif, um, what is the future of the ecosystem, not only in the region, why maybe uh, in all across the world. <laughs> That's a pretty Taking into consideration, <laughs> COVID is not going away. COVID is not going away anytime soon. So how how the future, the, let's let's say the short term future a, looks like. We have a vaccine. Like. We have a vaccine. Okay, ninety uh, percent. Which is we're gonna need a couple of years to get hands on in our markets. So, so how yeah. do you think the ecosystem will look like in the next a year or two, and how investors will be? There? will react to that, to the, those changes? Look, I, I, I can't predict the future, but you know, I don't think we're going to see a lot of change in, in how things are working from, you know, startups are still going to start startups in down markets and in up markets. Uh, what sectors are hot and, and being focused on or interested, interesting to investors? We've already seen a shift to healthcare and ed tech, logistics, um, uh, communications already during the pandemic. But for, for many of you guys and us who are in tech for a long time anyway, working remotely and communicating digitally was a norm anyway. So, you know, just to see massive adoption of those things, great. You know, you were kind of already doing it anyway. Uh, you know, it's great for sectors that were not getting a lot of attention before that are uh, trying to tackle very large incumbent industries uh, that, that haven't been tech enabled yet in, in these emerging markets. So that's exciting, I think. We're gonna see a continuation of that. I don't think we're, we're, we're going to, you know, necessarily break anything or, or, or dramatically change the way that, that, that startup ecosystems are, are working today. I think the investment landscape shifts uh, as, it, as it usually does. Uh, so even here in the region in the last five years, it's shifted every two to three years uh, as to who are, who are the LPs that are investing in funds. Uh, whether it's part of their mandate, whether it's an impact or development mandate, is there external interest from investors? We're seeing that shift happen anyway every two to three years. And, and so one thing I've been looking at just in terms of the next five years is where are the sources of capital going to come from uh, for VC funds? And then where, where are the VCs going to be able to deploy capital into and how freely? So one of the things that was very notable between 2019 and now is sources of capital shifted to more of an in-country focus. And, and you even heard that because of the pandemic, countries are thinking about how they can be self-sufficient within their borders because you know people aren't traveling. Uh, so I think those things pairing together will tighten the, the ability of funds to be regional funds. So you're gonna have more country specific or in-country uh, uh, resources, operations and funding uh, so that will continue, I think, for a while. Um, investor interest from 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 the outside of, of you know a region is is slowly, very slowly increasing, and I don't think that's going to slow down. I think U.S. investors, European investors, are going to continue to look for new opportunities in emerging markets. For some reason, U.S. investors are attracted to Africa as as sub-Saharan Africa, but less so uh, to MENA as a region. Uh, Europeans uh, investors are typically, you know, the foreign direct investors, development funds, impact funds, only invest in developing countries, not the GCC. So it, it, this paints a very delineated picture where, you know, it should be more fluid. It should be more cross-border, just like this organization and this conference, right? We should not have to be navigating these landmines as founders uh, across every border and likewise as investors having to allocate to a particular country and make sure you have that allocation there. 
So I, I have a little bit of um, anxiety uh, because of that and how that's going to play out in the next few years. I think no country on its own in these markets can stand on its own. So if you oversupply capital in one country and, and under support talent in another country, to me, that's breaking the system and it's going to be a little bit of regression. So I, I don't know what the solution is, but we're going to have to work uh, to make sure that that, that doesn't, you know, uh, uh, slow down the growth of startups uh, or uh, the availability and optionality of capital. Okay, Sharif, uh, thank you so much. Um, I don't think we have much more time. I second everything you said in terms of uh, having things regional, especially in our region, because you, as you know, some countries are dependent on the another on other countries for talent. Some countries are dependent on others for customers. And if we decide to support a country and stop supporting the other one or, or basically de development funds start basically focusing on on let's say countries and forget completely about gcc i'm not sure how this will work for for our region uh, thank you so much claudia thank you so much sharif i wish i had more time to chat with you guys um thank you so much anect um it was a pleasure and i think we should continue this discussion some other day Thank you so much, uh, Valentina and everyone at uh, Startup Without Borders for having all of us. And I'll see you guys in the next summit. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Bye. Be safe. Okay, guys. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> um,